Donovan Mitchell is proving a building block for the Jazz in life after Gordon Hayward, writes Michael Scotto. All-star Gordon Hayward broke the hearts of fans in Utah when he left during free agency, but rookie Donovan Mitchell is starting to mend them one play at a time. The six-foot-three guard has helped Utah win seven of its last 11 games, including five straight wins, by averaging 20.2 points, 4.5 assists, 4.0 rebounds, and 1.5 steals per game. After a slow start, Mitchell has found his rhythm, shooting 45.5% from the field, 41.3% from downtown and 81.6% from the foul line during that span. Mitchell ranks second on Utah in scoring 16.4 and usage percentage 28.3. Among all rookies, he ranks third in scoring 16.4 and fourth in steals 1.3 and free throw percentage 82.0. While Mitchell currently ranks among the top rookies in his class, he isn't thinking about winning Rookie of the Year. I don't, to be honest with you. Mitchell told Basketball Insiders during a video interview on November 18. I would say the first two or three games I was kind of thinking about it, to be honest with you. I had the names saved in my background of the guys who were projected to win it, and that was all I would think about. First of all, that's selfish, and that's not who I am. I want to go out there and be able to help my team impact and win in any way possible. I think, thinking about the Rookie of the Year award leads to more of a self-driven thing and selfish type of thing, so I just want to focus on being able to make the playoffs. That's the biggest thing, make the playoffs. Help my team win in any way possible in any way that I can. Lakers rookie Kyle Kuzma won the Western Conference Rookie of the Month award, and Mitchell responded by having a career night with 41 points hours later. Mitchell joined Stephen Curry, Kevin Durant, and Blake Griffin as the only rookies to have 40 or more points, 4 or more rebounds and 4 or more assists on 25 or fewer field goal attempts since 2000, according to basketball insiders Ben Dowsett. Mitchell also became the first rookie since Stephen Curry in 2010 to hit 5 or more 3-pointers in consecutive games, as Dowsett noted. Utah got a star, man, for real. All-star opponent DeMarcus Cousins told reporters after witnessing Mitchell's 41 points firsthand. Without Hayward, Utah has attempted to turn the page by becoming an even stronger defensive team in front of center Rudy Gobert, a perennial defensive player of the year candidate. The former Louisville Cardinal was an ALAC defensive team member. General Manager Dennis Lindsay gave up former lottery pick Trey Lyles and Utah's no. 24 overall selection Tyler Lydon to move up Denver's no. 13 selection and take Mitchell. After the draft, Lindsay continued to add players with a defensive mindset, such as Jonas Jerebko, Thabo Cephalosha, who remains a serviceable wing defender at 33, and Ekpe Udo, who was the Euroleague leader in blocks per game 2.3 in Bakhtar backs for Fenerbahce. Udo also was the Euroleague leader in rebounds per game 7.8 last. As a result, Utah is causing the second most turnovers in the league per game 17.2 and is holding opponents to the fifth fewest points per game 100.0. We're a solid defensive team, and I think with guys being out, guys have stepped up, and that's the NBA, Mitchell told Basketball Insiders. Guys are ready to step up whenever their number is called, and I think we've done a great job of that. We've had a little bit of, a few lapses throughout the, but just going out there, just playing the way we know we can play. With Rudy being out, it's a big test to see who's going to step up defensively, and I think we've all responded the right way. we just got to continue it. While Mitchell has picked up his play immensely, the rookie is absorbing veteran advice from his teammates to help avoid the dreaded, rookie wall. You know, basketball. The life of basketball, this hole can consume you and stress you out a little bit, so being able to find something to do in your downtime. Mitchell told Basketball Insiders, rest is important. Sometimes, like I said, getting your mind off of things, going out, whether it's watching Netflix. I'm big, I'm an avid Netflix watcher, going to top golf, and I go to a lot of the university high school basketball games to just keep my mind free, and just go out there and do whatever, so when you get into the game time, it's time to focus, Mitchell hopes to hang up his sneakers many years down the road after a long and prosperous career. When he does, he knows the legacy he wants to leave behind. Just a kid who's underrated. Mitchell told Basketball Insiders, I love that role. Just going out there and works his butt off every day.
don't like being outworked, and just going out there and just trying to prove to people wrong, and go out there and do what I know I can. For a quarter of the, Mitchell has proven to be a building block for the future in Utah as the organization turns the page from the Gordon Hayward era. Believe it or not, the Trailblazers are leading the pack in the mighty Northwest Division. A few years ago, the Portland Trail Blazers looked like a team that was on its way to becoming a true contender in the Western Conference. They had an established all-star in Lamarcus Aldridge, a budding all-star in Damian Lillard and a solid cast of supporting players such as Wesley Matthews, Nicholas Batum, and Robin Lopez. During the 201,314, they won 54 games and advanced to the second round of the playoffs where they fell to the eventual champion San Antonio Spurs. The following year, they won 51 games but lost in the first round to the Memphis Grizzlies. It pretty much blew up after that. Aldridge left as a free agent to the Spurs, Matthews to the Dallas Mavericks, Lopez to the New York Knicks and Batum was traded to the Charlotte Hornets. They looked like a team in position for a high lottery finish. Instead, C.J. McCollum broke out. A couple of underrated free agent signings such as Ed Davis and Alfaro Camino paid off and the Blazers finished with another winning in a playoff appearance. This year, they're firmly in the mix for a playoff spot in the Western Conference. Not just that, they're actually a contender for home court advantage in the first round. They're currently in fourth place in the West, a half game up on the Denver Nuggets, and two games behind the Spurs for third. Just like during the 201,516, they success this, at least recently, has come largely in part to a couple of unheralded players on the roster. Head coach Terry Stotts has tinkered with the rotation a bit, inserting fourth-year forward Noah Von Lair and third-year forward Pat Connaughton in the starting lineup. Von Lair was put in the starting lineup permanently back on November 18. Before that, he was part of a rotating contingent with rookie Caleb Swanigan at starting power forward following an ankle injury to Aminu on November. One since then, the Blazers have gone 52 with Von Lair showing the potential that led the Hornets to make him a lottery pick in the 2014 draft. During that stretch, Von Lair has registered double-digit rebounds in four of those games. He's shooting 54.2% from the field, a career high. He's also had solid showings on the defensive end. In a recent win over the Knicks on November 27, Von Lair did a good job defensively on Kristaps Porzingis in the fourth quarter, limiting his touches and staying in front of him. While Von Lair is doing the dirty work defensively and on the glass, Connaughton has thrived defensively. Prior to this, he had never averaged more than 8.1 minutes per game. He spent most of his first twos sitting on the bench. This, he's up to 19.1 minutes per game and was put in the starting lineup on November 24 to replace the struggling Mo Harkless. In the four games he's been a starter, he's put up 9.3 points per game on 65.9% shooting from the field, and 35.4% from three-point range. He's given the Blazers an option to space the floor in the front court as neither Von Lehr nor starting center Yusuf Nurkic are particularly adept at outside shooting. The Blazers are 31 with Connaughton in the starting lineup, and he's so far proving to be more consistent on the offensive end than Harkless had been. It's unlikely that the Blazers end up challenging the Golden State Warriors, Houston Rockets, and probably the Spurs for Western Conference supremacy this. But for a team that essentially rebuilt on the fly, they've done a pretty solid job. They should make the playoffs, and depending on how much of a boost their new starters give them, might find themselves hosting a playoff series for the first time since 2009. Spencer Davies lists six fresh names to pay attention to in the race for Defensive Player of the Year. It's the beginning of December and we're about one quarter into the NBA's calendar year. Thus far here on Basketball Insiders, twice we've highlighted names to watch out for when it comes to Defensive Player of the Year. Injuries have still kept the big-name contenders such as Rudy Gobert and Kawhi Leonard out of the picture, but at the same time, they've given other players an opportunity to receive the spotlight. Let's take a look at some fresh names included in our third installment of our DPOY Watch series. 6. Josh Richardson detailed on Basketball Insiders in an exclusive interview just a few days ago. The third-year wing is a definite bright spot for the Miami Heat as they try to combat the temporary loss of Hassan Whiteside. Regarding individual defense, Richardson has held opponents to a lowly 36.2% success rate, which is the best in the NBA among those attempting at least 10 field goals per game. 
In addition, the Heat's defensive rating is a 13.7 without him on the floor, a number that puts the 24-year-old in the 97th percentile according to cleaning the glass all stats from here on courtesy of CTG unless otherwise specified. 5. Ben Simmons Our last edition of the DPOY Watch mentioned one half of the Philadelphia 76ers duo Joel Embiid, so why not show some love to the other guy? It's understood that he is a rookie and he likely won't win the award, but the defensive intangibles we've seen from Simmons have been much more advanced than your average first-year player. Ranking first in defensive real plus minus 2.38 and defense box plus minus 3.9 amid point guards by a wide margin, the 6-foot-10 Aussie hasn't taken long to establish himself as a two-away threat in this league. For Luke NBA Hamut remember this summer's prediction about the Houston Rockets moving away from being one-dimensional. It's becoming true. There have been quite a few blowouts, but that doesn't take away from how great the team has been defensively. In fact, it should only support the argument. As specified by CTG, the Rockets are the fifth-best defensive team 103 DTRG in the NBA. No, there hasn't been a head coaching change. This is the same Mike Dantonald group. They're still almost impossible to guard. The only difference now is they've added pieces to fluster their competition as well. One of those players is NBA Hamut. Although he comes off the bench, the veteran forward has arguably been Houston's most effective defender. When NBA Hamut is on the court, the team allows fewer than 100 points per 100 possessions. If he's off the floor, the Rockets' DTRG balloons to 107.7. 3. Anthony Davis The New Orleans Pelicans don't have the best defense in the world because of their lack of wings, but they're smack dab in the middle of the league with a 106.5 DTRG and it would be an entirely different story if DeMarcus Cousins and Davis weren't in the paint deterring every shot attempt in sight. We've already given props to Boogie multiple times in this watch series, so let's have a look at the impact the brow has for this group. Firstly, the Pelicans are 14.8 points per 100 possessions worse defensively when Davis is off the floor. Their defensive rating is 102.4 in the opposite case. The discrepancy is in the 98th percentile. Furthermore, he's one of 12 players in the NBA who is averaging at least a point and a steal per game. The volume of shots Davis is seeing per game is telling, too. Opponents are averaging 14 shots on a nightly basis against him, but are only converting on 39.2% of those attempts, a number that places at the top of the league in regards to those defending the same amount of tries. To Eric Bledsoe almost a month ago, the Phoenix Suns traded the disgruntled point guard to the upstart Bucks. It took a week or so for him to get settled in with his new ball club, but, outside of Yanis Antetokounmpo, he's already become the most important player on the team. In 10 games with Milwaukee, the muscular 6-foot-1 guard is locking up his opposition. A perfect example of that would be Thursday's battle with Damian Lillard. The 27 minutes he was on the floor against the Portland Trail Blazers All-Star, Bledsoe held him to 38.5% from the field and forced five turnovers. If you look at the way he limited John Wall and Reggie Jackson in those matchups, you'd find similar success. If that's too small of a sample size, take something like this Bledsoe has the best defensive rating on the team. Using CTG statistics, the Bucks are allowing 96.5 points per 100 possessions with him playing. When he's sitting, that ETRG rises by 20.5. It's a net difference that is in the 100th percentile. It's the kind of impact that has Milwaukee ranked in the top 10 defensively over the last two weeks. One LeBron James one month ago, having James on this list would have been laughable. The Cleveland Cavaliers were the second-worst defensive team in the NBA to only the lowly Phoenix Suns. It was a rocky beginning for the well-seasoned group, until they got their legs under them and began to dominate that end of the floor. While the second unit has been responsible for the majority of the team's success, it's been James who has been tasked with the toughest of assignments, but he's welcomed the challenges with open arms, especially in the clutch. It started at Madison Square Garden against Chris Apps Porzingis, whom the Cavaliers held to 31% with James on the floor before making a huge comeback. Then there was a match-up with the Los Angeles Clippers where Blake Griffin only made one shot out of eight attempts in the fourth quarter and was limited to 32% from the field overall. What might be even more astounding is he was equally as great against guards. Referred to when Kemba Walker was having his way in Cleveland one week ago during the first half. 
Tyron Lee went to James starting in the third quarter and he absolutely stifled him, holding the Charlotte Hornets Dynamo to 18.2% from the field and zero points in the final period. You can even use Thursday night as an example, when Dennis Schroeder was scorching hot for the Atlanta Hawks until LeBron became responsible for him. He is tied for best defender in the fourth quarter among those seeing at least three attempts per game, restricting his opponents to a 32.7 field goal percentage. He's blocking shots. He's contesting shots. He's lurking in the passing lanes. He's getting steals. If this continues throughout the, and it makes sense to suspect it will, James should certainly be in the conversation as the league's top defender. With the Cavaliers facing point guard issues, LeBron James has been incredible. With the Cleveland Cavaliers excelling during elite this 10-game win streak, despite utter chaos at the point guard position, LeBron James has had to do a little bit of everything. With Derrick Rose pondering his future, Isaiah Thomas still unavailable and Iman Chumpet, another player who can spend time defending point guards, facing surgery, James was called upon in Atlanta Thursday night to match up defensively against Hawks point guard Dennis Schroeder. It depends on what we need, said Cavaliers coach Tyron Lue of what he asks of James on a Gamito game basis. Each game is different. Tonight we needed him to defend and guard. I think he only took 11 shots tonight but Kevin Love was good, Jay Crowder was good, Jeff Green. So, when guys are shooting the basketball and scoring and we need him to guard point guards, he stood up and did it and then everybody chipped in as far as scoring. Schroeder racked up a gamma high 17 points in the first half, helping to take Atlanta to a 6,763 lead. With former Hawk Jose Calderon unable to stay in front of Schroeder, James took the task upon himself out of the break. I just wanted to take the challenge against Schroeder, said James in the visitors' locker room. He's one of the fastest guys we've got in our league. He was kicking our butts in the first half, Lou explained his thought process on Cleveland's half-time defensive adjustments. In the second half, I decided to start big and bring Jeff in there and put Ron on Schroeder, said Lou. He did an unbelievable job, one of the best I've seen all year. So that was big time for us, for him to guard Schroeder, and he got some big stops. The coach added that James' defense has been a recurring theme during the current streak. He's playing good defense, guarding Kristaps Porzingis, guarding Schroeder tonight, said Lou. He's a great position defender against those point guards, knowing how to give them space but also be able to contest the shot and also be able to contest them at the basket because he's bigger. Tonight, they put us in some tough situations. We tried to blitz Schroeder, we tried to go under, we tried to switch. He's a tough cover for us. An absolute master of his craft, James called upon his internalized database to approach the assignment against Schroeder. He's very shifty with his right-to-left crossover and his left-to-right crossover, said James. And once he gets a hip on you, he does a great job of keeping you there and finishing at the rim, which you saw a lot in the second quarter where he just kept getting bucket after bucket. I know pros and cons of every player on every team of what they like to do and not like to do on a possession. James got even more granular in his analysis of a huge block against Hawks second-year forward Taurian Prince. I figured if I forced him left, I cut off his right hand, he would have to try to shoot it with his left hand which played by the percentages, the percentages are way down for him, said James. He couldn't get all the way to the rim because I was on his hip. So once he picked the ball up, he only had two steps. And I just read his feet. Wherever the ball was going to go, that's where it was going to take me. I planned on it to go a little higher than it did, and I just blocked it right to Dwade. While James craftsmanship on defense has been a boost for the Cavaliers during the streak, Lou said another benefit has been Love's acclamation to the center position. He had some tough matchups over the last six games, two with Dwight Howard, Joel Embiid, Hassan Whiteside, Andre Drummond, said Lou. He's been great and now he's shooting the ball better. I think he's taken a liking to the five because he knows he's going to get open shots and if teams put smaller guys on him, he's going to be able to post them. With Cleveland's point guard situation likely to remain unsettled for the foreseeable future, Love's improved play and James' mastery of the craft of basketball are two factors that have helped. The Cavaliers are the hottest team in basketball despite monumental challenges. And if it's to remain so, James will have to continue to do a little bit of everything.